morning. Oh, sounds a bit dirty, doesn't it? Done that 100,000 miles now, my car. Mm. Let's uh, ooh. seem to want to move. I've got a gravel drive, and what happens is the uh, car settles into a rut because I park it in the same place every day, so the wheels are all inside little holes. And we're off. Side lights on. Side lights on when I can't read the dashboard and headlights on when I can see the headlights on the road. That's my rule, because it's all done automatically now. I mean, you don't, you don't do that, do you? You drive a car where the headlights come on automatically, don't you? You drive a car where if you're on full beam and a car comes the other way, the headlights dip automatically, don't you? Yes, well, I don't. I drive this car, which cost me £6,000. My father bought it out of his money for me because he was in a wheelchair. It's wheelchair adapted and it looks like Postman Pat's back. It's the most little old granddad's type uh, of car you can you can uh, <laughs> imagine and as I've said before it's thin which is good on the country lanes but in a way it's small but it's massive because it's wheelchair adapted it's had the floor drops and so when I put the chairs forward you could get a, a dresser in the back so if you don't I bet you drive something like a, a Tesla with a frunk that you can't get a decent uh, you know, you can only fit a large shoe box. Oh, oh no. Oh no. Anyway, how are you? I hope you're well. I haven't just insulted you for two minutes. Let's turn the blowers off. Get the noise down a bit. Oh, slow down, slow down. I've been uh, shouting at these cars. <coughs> Funnily enough, there's two things I want to just fill you in on. One is... Uh, the videos you'll may have noticed well you will have noticed by the time you see this one that we've uploaded a load of um, videos I'm uploading about four a day at the moment which is like unheard of like even doing one a day was difficult doing two a day was a miracle and now I'm gonna do four a day every day until I clear the backlog and I have got a backlog because I've just done 25th 26th 27th 28th of April so it's quite funny to watch myself talking about how lovely the weather is and how all the cherry blossoms out on the trees when this is my drive to work now. There's no no leaves on the trees, let alone any cherry blossom. So, but anyway, uh, you know, I did uh, I do cover quite a lot of stuff, including there's one called Director's Car, which I think is worth watching, which is like my definitive take on why there's no NHS dentistry. In other words the uh, macroeconomic uh, problems, which, you know, I mean, <laughs> I, I don't want to sort of bring the Barry Cockroft type personalities into this, although they did contribute and, and not in an insignificant way, but I've sort of tried to stick to the macroeconomic principles and mistakes that were made, which led to the demise of the NHS dentistry and, dentist and NHS in general in 2021, because I think that uh, 2021 is probably Although most people haven't realised it yet, I think it is pretty much was the year that, of the demise of the National Health Service, the year when it broke down completely because it was always dysfunctional and Covid just broke it, you know. Anyway, queue I mean, a tonne of criticism from people saying that uh, the NHS is the jewel in the nation's crown and uh, the people who work in it are all angels. <laughs> Okay, get it off your chest, okay, get it off your chest. Been listening to it for 40 years, okay. As the uh, as the service has gone down the Swanee. And <clears throat> believe me, just saying that doesn't help. Really, if you're the sort of person that says the NHS is great and it shouldn't be privatised and everybody works in it as a martyr, you're not really helping, you're really not. You know, you're not helping at all. You'd be better off just studying the subject a bit more, learning what's happening on the ground a bit more, 
and uh, thinking a bit more about uh, uh, healthcare and money and how money is used to provide healthcare and what works and, and what doesn't, you know. Anyway, so so that's the video. Now, what's the uh, why are they suddenly starting? Uh, you know, and the answer is that I've got now a uh, Starlink satellite, one of Elon Musk's Starlinks. And I don't think you're going to get one because you're not, because there's probably about a two-year waiting list, and that's because you can get some insane upload speeds. You can get. I'm getting about 185 megabits up, uh, down rather, and uh, probably about 40 or 50 up. Whereas previously I was getting 14 down and about two up. So you can imagine this like a 10x, 12x, 15x speed increase for me. And uh, <clears throat> so it's fantastic. And it, what it's done is it's leapfrogged my home internet above my work internet. And my work internet, I work in a, in a place that laughingly calls itself an innovation center, but which is basically a, a tax fiddle. And uh, has no, has no, uh, you know, there's no innovation in there at all. In fact, they, it takes, I've asked them just to paint the outside because they haven't painted the outside for six years. And they've uh, told me I've got to wait nine months just to have a bit of paint put on the outside. So, you know, it's just not, uh, it's not, uh, anyway, it's not, it's not what it says on the tin. So, but you would expect um, an innovation centre to have really blisteringly fast internet, wouldn't you? But no, in fact, no, my um, home internet is now faster than, than my internet at the innovation centre. Although, the, you know, the innovation centre internet is probably fast enough and... While they have got a couple of web design companies in the innovation centre... Um, That, you know, think think that they would like something faster. For the vast majority of people, like the chiropodists and the uh, uh, the scanning people, you know, the ultrasonic scan clinic, uh, you know, they, 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 uh, the internet for them is, is faster than they're ever going to need. You know, they just do web surfing and email. So what I'm doing is I've got the fast computer at home. I'm doing. I was. I, I store everything at work on the big server at work. Uh, I, I got uh, everything uh, is processed at home, the editing, and then I used to have to then take it back to work to um, uh, to back to work to uh, store it. But now what I'm doing is I am just taking everything home, processing it, uploading it from home, and then there's just the one uh, uh, trip to uh, work to upload which I do on a USB stick, basically. It's, you know, I mean, it's coming to something when the fastest way to uh, transmit data in this country is in on, on a USB stick in your pocket, but that is still the case. Anyway, uh, so that's the with the videos. The videos are going well, so now I'm recording another one, blethering on about nothing. Um, the other thing that uh, I was going to uh, just update you on is the court case. Well, I call it the court case, although it's never going to come to court. I did say these things never go to court, but I can sort of fill you in a bit more on um, how it works, you know, having had first-hand experience of it. Just to recap, in case you didn't see the previous episodes, the story so far. I did a root treatment on someone, and she said it was mildly uncomfortable, and... Um, <clears throat> So, I, uh, you know, in <laughs> really, just so that another dentist could tell her that it was it'd been done reasonably well and it would probably settle down in time, I suggested she see another dentist. And this other dentist uh, was uh, old school and decided that he'd use it as an uh, opportunity to stick the knife in. So he told her that the root treatment hadn't been done very well at all and that it was overfilled and in as touching a sinus whatever the f that means and that um basically she got a good case for uh, compensation and because this woman is a sort of semi-paranoid uh, conspiracy theorist who thinks that fluoride is an attempt to poison everybody um readily swallowed this narrative and decided to approach 
um, the biggest gangsters in the dental uh, market, dental law partnership, who uh, specialise in shaking down indemnity societies. So what happens was they, they uh, then uh, drew up a long list of stuff they uh, alleged was negligent. Um, and, um, you know, I mean, but stuff like uh, the fact that I hadn't made a note of what um, irrigation fluid I'd used inside the canal and stuff like this. I mean, trivial stuff, which they've got a long list of, and then they just, uh, it's a case of throwing up um, jelly at the wall and eventually some of it will stick. So they threw a load of jelly off to my uh, indemnity people who wrote to me and said, um, uh, who wrote to me and said, look, uh, you know, we might win this, but we might lose it. Uh, if we um, uh, decide to fight it, then we're gonna need to get um, an expert's opinion, which is in itself is gonna cost somewhere between a thousand and two thousand pounds. Um, what do you reckon? And the point is this letter is very, very highly biased towards trying to get you to say, oh, just uh, pay it, you know, don't go to court, just pay it. Because from the indemnity point of view, um, they don't want to go to court. They're the mathematics in their, uh, unless it's an open and shut case, where you're definitely going to win, then they don't want to go to court because the chance of them losing means that they might lose a pile of money. Um, and so uh, they're very, very uh, keen to try and get you to suggest to them because they, they don't want to suggest it to you, but you know they don't want to fight it but then that's the art of writing this letter is to sort of subliminally suggest to you that it might not be in your best interest to go to court over it all and so in order to do that they sort of drip poison on your on your dentistry and you end up thinking well look these people are my uh, my legal defense team and they're dripping poison on my dentistry what what hope have i got in court you know when, when the other side's uh, doing a much better job. So obviously you're inclined to say, no, well, just, you know, what they do is they say, well, uh, we'll, we'll offer uh, 8,000 pounds. Now, bearing in mind, this is for a woman who's got some mild discomfort from a, a root filling, which is almost certainly not, not has gone away now. And she's being given 8,000 pounds on the basis that she definitely needs uh, an atraumatic extraction, a sinus lift, an implant and an implant retained crown. Um, I'd love to go to court and test that assumption. You know, I'd, it's such a shame there isn't a way to put the money in trust to pay for that should she require it and, and such that she can't get her hands on it should she not require it. And it's all a fabrication by the Dental Law Partnership, which is what it is, you know. None of my patients who's had a mildly uncomfortable uh, uh, root filling has ever had to have it extracted and had to have a sinus lift and an implant and it's all just they just bulk it all out and then on top of the eight thousand pounds um the patient's going to get they award four thousand pounds in fees plus fat so it's going to come to i don't know somewhere between 13 and fifteen thousand quid payout but now from the insurance company you see that's still cost effective because to take it to court you know I mean that's the cost of one junior barrister isn't it uh, for you know for a day in court or whatever or a couple of days in court but for, um, if you look at it from the point of view of dental law partnership you can see why they persist in this uh, in this uh, behavior because from their point of view this woman's come along she hasn't really got anything much of a claim and yet they've turned it into a £4,000 payday and an £8,000 payday for the uh, patient and there's a couple of things you know uh, I think that are relevant to this one is that it's a bit like um, suing for libel or slander in a way um, supposing somebody sues you for libel or slander and you're minded to try and defend the case, but or uh, but the, the problem you've got is that there there is possibly one element 
or it might be one in a hundred elements or one one in ten element that is true but nine of them are false but you want to you want to sue them for slander and the point is that the legal advice will be that if what they're saying <clears throat> is wholly false wholly false <coughs> in other words they've got you mixed up with another person and they printed something by mistake without checking it and said something slanderous or wrote something libelous about you that's wholly without merit, then you should sue them and you will almost certainly win and win large damages. However, if they are they are talking about you and they mostly, it's almost all wrong, but there is like an element of truth to some part of it, then you shouldn't you can't and you shouldn't sue them because what will happen is the, the judge or the jury will then think well that that part of it was true therefore it's likely that the rest of it there's some grain of truth in the rest of it and so you you cannot win the case unless you're wholly blameless and dental law partnership know this you know so what they do is they they uh, sue you on the basis of uh, 99 things that you did correctly and you don't defend it on the basis of the one thing that you think the judge might find that you did wrong. You know, like overfilled the canal or something. So, you know, it's not, it's not satisfactory, it's just one of those things. It's never happened to me before in 40 years of practice. I'm rather hoping it'll never happen again. The, um, you know, but there is a risk. There is a risk. And I know this because I had an associate who was taken to the GDC, did a few implants. He was coming to the end of his career. And I think he just relaxed a bit in terms of standards. I think he decided that, you know, and this is the problem. I think it's a problem with dentists towards the end of their career. They tend to think, okay, you know, I've got this. I'm getting to the point where I'm not going to have any repeat business. In fact, in six months, I'm not going to have any business at all. So why don't I just do all the things that I've stopped myself doing all these years? and just get a bit of money, a bit more money before I retire. And if that means putting in an implant without taking the uh, route out first, <laughs> you know, or taking an x-ray and no, noticing that there is a route in there, then then uh, well, at the end of the day, there's no copay on the indemnity. So you, you don't pay anything. You don't have to even turn up to the GDC. You just retire. And, uh, and a medical defence union gets to sort out all your your mess that you've left, you know? Now, the problem with that is, there's two problems with that, is that uh, where you have been uh, found in breach by the GDC and possibly suspended, and then bearing in mind this is a more serious case than my case, um, this is my case was just a root treatment that had a bit of post-operative discomfort. But supposing you have been found to be wanting by the GDC and they have suspended you because they, even though you've retired and moved to America, uh, they will insist on going through the motions, you know, of um, having a, a highly expensive hearing because that's obviously how they will make their money. Uh, even though you're, and, and suspending you from the register that you've already haven't paid your renewal on so you're not going to come back on. Um, the news uh, will and can get round uh, not necessarily everybody and not necessarily in the paper but it might be um, uh, just a few patients talking to each other you know and they will say oh you know uh, Mrs Miggins uh, took Mr what's his name to the General Dental Council and he's been struck off and that's a good that's a juicy bit of gossip you know <laughs> And so what will happen is that, and I, ha I know about this because I had two or three or four requests for notes following the original uh, complaint from other people who were saying, no, oh, I, hear, I hear my dentist was, was a shocker, you know, I hear he was, he's been disciplined, you know, I hear that I, I went there and I, all that time I thought he was a lovely bloke and uh, I was very happy with his work, but I now found that, it, no, I now found that he's a, he's a villain. And I want my notes so I can possibly send them off and see if I can get £8,000. So there's that aspect to it. So you have to be very, very careful about, um, you know, there must be, I, I assume that they're going to put in the settlement. 
which they should do if they know, you know, they're Brussels sprouts, is to um, put in that there's no admission of guilt on our part, you know. It's a no fault settlement, and, we, and which is what it is, because basically what we have done is we have paid this woman to go away. We have paid this woman, we have paid this woman a certain amount of money, which is less than it would cost to fight her claim. And that's not right in a way. It's not right that um, uh, a patient should be able to hold you to ransom to the extent that they know that it will cost you 10, 15, 20,000 pounds to fight their claim uh, and therefore they only ask for eight because they know by the time you add on a bit for the solicitor, uh, you're gonna, you know, it's a bit like a lawyer I once knew who uh, put in an objection to a local uh, shopping center totally unfounded but they gave him ten thousand pounds just to stop worrying them and uh, and he got ten thousand pounds for nothing and came in and boasted about it to me as his dentist you know, he says it's a totally unfounded uh, objection but he said but they don't want objections they want to build a building they want to build a shopping center so they just gave me ten quid ten grand and it's a shakedown and that's what DLP does they're a shakedown I'm not saying they don't have any genuine cases but I'm both, for the most part uh, they shook me down or rather they shook down my, my indemnifiers. And the other thing is that I think uh, as you get towards the end of your profession, um, you know, if you come up in front of anyone like the General Dental Council or, uh, um, you know, your indemnifiers, they look at it and you think, oh, what, he's, he's 62, you know, he trained when uh, Margaret Thatcher was the Prime Minister. Uh, he's... Um, He's like uh, more, more, much more than some young idiot who's just come out of dental school and knows and thinks they know everything. He needs to be culled from the pack. Old dentists need to be culled. We have this funny thing in the profession where we're like a pack of dogs and if you can't, you know, if you're elderly, then, uh, you know, <laughs> you care. It's generally, you're generally regarded as uh, being, being uh, you know, you're required to go off somewhere and die. <laughs> and, and so all this uh, fantastic management skills we bring and the, um, the, the, our approach to treatment, which may not be um, totally in accordance with the latest sort of fascist teachings, um, are, is, is we're persecuted, I think. I honestly would put, I would say like that we are persecuted and we are basically sort of made to feel that it, the world would be a better place if we did retire and just uh, grow uh, grow roses and you know stuff like that so I'm feeling a bit bloody sorry for myself at the moment sorry about that <laughs> anyway that's what to expect if uh, if you do a root treatment and a patient uh, gets a bit of mild discomfort two out of ten as she described it my only tip to you will be don't suggest that the patient goes to another dentist you know, because you are, as a dentist, I've honestly, I've, whenever a patient has come to me and said, look, you know, what do you think of this? I've tried, I've tried to say, look, you know, it's all very well saying, yeah, I could have done better than that. But you don't know you could have done better than that. You do not know you could have done better than that. Because you don't know the circumstances. You don't know what time the patient, uh, day the patient was treated. You don't know what, how good they were opening their mouth. You don't know how difficult they were to get numb. You don't know whether they kept insisting on sitting up and spitting and rinsing or wouldn't wear a rubber dam or what. So don't think you could do better. Don't think you could do better. The chances are two dentists of roughly equal ability will do roughly equal a uh, job, you know, and that doesn't mean that you could do better. Uh, so, but and I've tried to live by that, but uh, other dentists don't. And this guy obviously I think I'm pretty sure he perceives me as a threat because I'm a local dentist, I'm a local private dentist, so is he, and he's uh, one of these uh, Marxist-Leninist zero-sum thinkers who thinks that there's only a certain amount of wealth and luck in the world, and for him to get more, someone else has to get less. And that's, that's, that's what motivated his, um, his report. But anyway, I'm not, I don't hold it against him. I never hold uh, it against people if they're stupid. So uh, <laughs> on that note, bye for now.